is day number six of Valencrimes week. I'm sorry that I missed an upload on Friday. I did let you know in the comments and on social media, but just in case you didn't see, um, the video just took a lot longer to upload than I thought it would. And so it wouldn't have been ready until like midnight or something stupid. So I thought I'll just save it for the next day and we'll do Valencrimes week until Monday. So there's a video today and a video tomorrow. So today we are gonna be talking about the solved case of Jennifer Webb. Quickly before I get into this video, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So Jennifer Webb, known as Jenny to her family and friends, was a 32 year old woman from Buena Vista in Michigan. Jenny was such a positive person. She was so happy all the time. She never let anything get her down. She had just such a lust for life. She was very, very likeable. Her family likened her to a magnet, like everyone just wanted to be Jenny's friend. She worked in customer service at PF Markey, which is like an industrial tool company, I think. And in 2011, Jenny was eight and a half months pregnant with her very first baby. And when she first told her family that she was pregnant, they were all really shocked because they didn't, Jenny wasn't in a relationship. They didn't even think she was seeing anyone. And Jenny herself was equally as shocked because she actually only found out she was pregnant when she was five months along. Jenny quickly decided that she was definitely going to keep this baby and so her family obviously had a lot of questions. Who was the father of this baby? Jenny said that it was a man that she had been friends with for almost 10 years at this point. Although her family had never met him, she'd known him for a very long time. And she did tell her family the father's name, but I'm not going to tell you that just yet. And so her family had even more questions. How long has this been going on with you and your friend? Are you together? Are you going to get together? But Jenny told her family, no, they're not together and they're not really going to get together because he was actually married. Although her family believed that Jenny was under the impression that him and his wife were separated, they weren't living together, they were going to go through the motions of a divorce but at the time they were still married. Jenny wasn't in love with this man, she didn't want to raise the child with this man, she didn't have this like fantasy of starting a life with him, she understood the situation and she was happy to bring up this baby herself. She recently bought a house to raise her son in, I don't know if I told you that before, it was actually a boy and she was going to call him Braxton. So on August 30th 2011 Jenny had her normal day at work and then after that she went to go and visit her friend Andrea. Her friend Andrea had recently had two twin girls and so she was going over just to kind of help out. And while she was there at Andrea's house, Jenny told Andrea that she actually had plans after that to go and meet up with the father of her baby just to discuss a few things. First of all, how they were gonna do child support, but second of all, Jenny wanted her father's name on the baby's birth certificate and the father was still a bit on the fence about it. Because of his marital situation, he didn't know whether it was fully appropriate to put his name on the birth certificate even though she wanted him to. So Jenny and Andrea made plans to see each other the next day and Jenny left Andrea's house to go and meet up with the father of her baby to go and discuss those things. But just a couple of hours later, Jennifer Webb, eight and a half months pregnant, was found dead in her car. Her Pontiac Aztec was parked in a ditch on a dead end road. An extension cord was tied to the luggage rack and the other end was around her neck. The body was discovered by police officer Kenneth Blue and quickly followed by officer Tim Patterson. It was very clear as soon as the officers pulled up what this scene was. It was very clear that it was a suicide. And so Kenneth Blue walked over to Patterson and said, how do you want to do this? So Patterson kind of assessed the scene, was looking at the body, was looking at the car and everything while Officer Blue went and got this woman's purse out of her car because neither of them recognised her so they needed to identify her. So he went in her purse and he was looking for an ID but first he found a folded up piece of paper and so he unfolded it and found what seemed to be a typed up and printed suicide note. In this note Jenny confesses to lying about the father of her baby he wasn't a married man, she just said that so that her family wouldn't ask too many questions, they wouldn't think badly of her. It was actually a man that she'd met in a bar one night and all she knew was that his name was Chris and this was just a one night thing and she never met him again. She talked about how she felt as though her life was a failure, she was a failure, her career was a failure and she just couldn't support this baby. Officer Blue then found Jennifer Webb's ID in her purse and as soon as he looked at it, he turned to Officer Patterson and said, oh God, I know this girl. It turned out that Officer Blue 
Lou had actually met Jenny Webb in a bar, a local bar a couple of times, but they never really had much of a friendship or a relationship, they just knew each other's names. So Officer Patterson called in a higher up to come and assess this scene while Officer Blue was taking photos of it. Jenny's body was removed and taken to a morgue, her car was towed and her family were informed of her passing. So the officer went and told Jenny's mother and as soon as he said that she'd passed away by taking her own life, Jenny's mother said, Jenny may be dead, but she didn't commit suicide. Her mother knew her better than anyone. She knew that Jenny was happy. She was excited. She'd just bought a new house. She loved her career. She was excited about her new baby. She would not commit suicide. And this was only confirmed in her mother's mind when she read that supposed suicide note. As soon as she read it, she knew that wasn't Jenny speaking. Not only was the wording off and unlike Jenny, it just didn't sound like anything that Jenny would say. Also, the fact that it was typed up and printed was very unlike her. Her mother said that if Jenny really was to write a suicide note, it'd be in glitter pens with a bunch of different colours. Each family member would have their own kind of personalised one. She wouldn't do it in such a cold way. So her family were convinced that this was not a suicide and so immediately they went to speak to police and voiced their concerns. And so police asked them a few questions, one of which being, do you know who the father of her baby was? And her parents said, yeah, of course we do. It's Kenneth Blue. Officer Kenneth Blue, the first person to the scene, the person that found Jennifer Webb dead, the person that didn't recognise her until he saw her ID, was the father of her baby. And Kenneth Blue was married, although he wasn't separating from his wife, he was actually supposedly happily married, but he was cheating. And so immediately the officers that were speaking to the family got a really bad feeling. And so obviously they couldn't investigate their own. Police officers from a police station can't investigate other ones that work there. So they got in the Michigan State Police to just take over this whole case. But obviously as soon as this new team got on the case, there was no crime scene anymore. Jenny's body had already been taken back to the morgue, her car had already been towed, everything had been cleaned up. So it was like starting a case from the beginning but not having the crime scene. It was gonna be so hard. All they really had was an empty ditch where the car once was and the evidence photographs that Kenneth Blue took himself. So they still went to the crime scene just to see if anything was maybe left in the grass or anything, just if there was anything that maybe they missed the first time. And all they really found was a pair of flip flops in the grass. And they couldn't work out whose they were either. They were just a pair of flip flops. So at one point, one of the officers went for a walk away from the crime scene just to kind of clear his head for a minute. This was probably very frustrating, as you can imagine. So this officer went about 200 feet away from the body. He was just kind of looking over this river. And then by pure chance, he decided to look down at his feet and he found something. Almost 200 feet away from where Jenny's body was found, there was a used cigarette butt on the floor. So that was obviously removed and taken for evidence and so this officer kept looking and then he found a blood spot on the floor and also a charm that looked like it had come off a necklace. So as this search of the crime scene was going on, Officer Blue's co-workers were being interviewed just to see if they noticed anything strange about Blue. Like I said, he was the first one at the scene that night, which is already suspicious enough in itself. So they questioned the second officer to the scene that evening, who was Tim Patterson, and he said that Officer Blue was ignoring his radio calls for an hour and a half before he eventually found him. And Blue never actually called him in to come to this body. Tim Patterson was kind of concerned that Blue wasn't answering his radio calls and so he went to this usual spot where Blue would often go to take a nap on the job on this dead end road by this ditch and as he pulled up, sure enough, he found Kenneth Blue and the victim and her car. Blue tried to explain this away by saying, oh, I'd only just arrived myself. I was just about to call Tim Patterson in, but I already saw his headlights. He was already here. But something about that just didn't seem right. It just kind of adds to the suspicion that he was already there and he hadn't told anyone that he'd found this potential crime scene. And Patterson recalled Kenneth Blue looking kind of disheveled and sweaty and out of breath and just 
Strange. So as the investigation went on, police found some evidence that could have potentially proved that Kenneth Blue was the father of Jenny's baby. In her phone, she had his number saved, which in itself already proves that they had some kind of relationship, be it a friendship or whatever, but his number was saved as Ken Cop Boo. Boo, which is like a pet name. And this was a woman that he claimed he only knew from a couple of interactions at a bar. But not only that, Jenny's phone records showed three calls made between her and Kenneth Blue on the night that she died. And of course, after police questioned Jenny's friend Andrea, they knew exactly why those calls were made. Jenny was supposed to be meeting up with Kenneth that night to kind of discuss child support and the birth certificate situation. So a couple of days later, police went back to the crime scene just to kind of have another look, see if there was anything they maybe missed the first time. And halfway through this second search, a car pulls up. And out of this car steps number one suspect, Kenneth Blue, to the crime scene. He was in his own clothes, so he wasn't in his uniform, he wasn't on the job. He was just, it was just a personal interest in this case. He was asking kind of like how the investigation's going just out of interest because he met this woman a couple of times at a bar and he just wanted to know how it was going. And obviously police actually sent him back to the police station. He wasn't allowed to be there if he was the suspect. But something we haven't talked about is Kenneth Blue's questioning. He was actually questioned the day after Jenny's body was found. And when I say questioning, this questioning started off very informal. It was literally like three police officers sat around a table laughing about how their phones kept going off and oh we should put them on silent we're so popular blah 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 it didn't seem like a murder interrogation it seemed like three police officers sat on their lunch break but anyway eventually this questioning got a little bit more serious a little bit more professional and blue began telling the story of how he found this body and how he'd only just got there before Patterson. He was just about to call him in. And he said he pretty much immediately went straight for the victim's purse to go and find her ID to find out who this victim was, but that was when he found the suicide note first. In his questioning, he was asked pretty much if he'd done his job properly. Did he check for signs of life in Jenny? To which he said no. It was pretty obvious that she was dead, so he just went straight for her ID to check who this victim was. They didn't even check to see if she was alive and if she could be saved. He said that it was just kind of obvious to him that this victim had already passed. He said that there was no movement, her chest wasn't rising and falling, her lips looked bluish, and so he thought it just best not to kind of disturb anything. So he could see that her lips were bluish, so he was obviously looking at her face, yet he didn't recognise this woman that he supposedly knew from bars. But then Kenneth Blue kind of changes his story. He admits that he has known Jenny Webb for 10 years and that they see each other every month, sometimes twice a month, yet he didn't recognise her at the scene. The reason he said he didn't recognise her, well, he actually gave a couple of reasons why he didn't recognise her, which to me is just trying really hard to prove his point. First of all, he said he was in cop mode. So he was so focused on getting his work done that he didn't even pay attention to the victim's face. But like, <laughs> that's not how facial recognition works. Like you don't have to be paying attention to a face and all its features to recognise it. If you just glance at a face, you will recognise it. Especially one that you've known for 10 years and meet up with every month. And if you're close enough to see that her lips are blue, you're close enough to recognise her face. But his next excuse was, oh, well, I've never really seen her in a state like that. Normally when I see her, she's got her hair done. As if her hair has anything to do with you recognising her face. If you've known her for 10 years, you've more than likely seen her with all different kinds of hairstyles. So that wouldn't influence whether you recognised her or not. Anyway, as Kenneth Blue was talking in this interview and kind of telling his story, one of the officers interviewing him noticed that he had a lot of scratches and marks on his arms. He also had a rather serious injury under one of his eyes, which he actually blames on playing with his dog. He said that it happened on the morning of the shift when he found Jenny. So his dog scratched him, he had his shift, and then by the end of the shift, he found Jenny's body. But during that shift, he sat and ate lunch with another officer, and this officer said that he didn't have any mark under his eye prior 
to finding Jenny's body. On top of those injuries, Blue also had a plaster on his finger, so you can imagine he had quite a serious injury on his finger that caused a lot of blood. He had scratches on his head and marks on his forearm. And the marks on his forearm were consistent with nail marks if someone was digging their nails into his arm. Multiple times during this interview, Kenneth Blue denied ever having a sexual relationship with Jenny Webb. There was absolutely no chance that he was the father and he had no idea who the father of the baby was. So police asked him, well, why has Jenny told all her family that you are the father of the baby then? And this was his response. <laughs> Wow. Kenneth Blue was then asked to give a DNA sample to kind of clear his name, which, if you're innocent, shouldn't be a problem. You should be willing to give a DNA sample. But Blue hesitated signing the form of consent and actually said this. Why is it that I'm feeling more and more like a suspect every time? As part of this whole investigation, police got in a medical examiner to come and give his opinion on whether he thinks this truly was a suicide or not. And as soon as he saw the crime scene photos, he said, absolutely not. First of all, how Jenny's body was found, she was sat with her back to the car, just kind of leaning against the car. There was no kind of hanging situation, meaning that there wouldn't be enough pull on this cord to strangle her. It would have been uncomfortable, it would have been tight, it would have probably left a mark, but certainly not kill her. They also, in her autopsy, found bruising all over her body. Hands, arms, face, neck, chest. Why was there so much bruising on a suicide victim? But not only that, the ligature mark around her neck that this extension cord supposedly made when she hung herself, that mark was actually made post-mortem, after she was already dead. So that can't have been her cause of death. Her cause of death was actually found to be from suffocation, specifically from a chokehold. So someone had killed her. Her death was ruled as a homicide. And Officer Kenneth Blue was trained in giving chokeholds as part of his police training. He actually trained other people. But what's even more suspicious, obviously as part of him training other people, he had this manual on how to train people on chokeholds. And that manual was actually found in the driver's side pocket of his car. And other officers say that this is very strange, like he wouldn't have needed that on him, especially if he's not training anyone at the time. Why would he need to take his manual around with him? And finally, at this point, the forensic results of testing on Jenny's body were coming back and it was not looking good for Kenneth Blue. Caught up in some of her clothing was the tip of a latex glove, so like one of the fingertips. And this was forensically tested and it was found to have blood on the inside and on the outside was blood and saliva. And when tested further, the blood on the inside of the glove was found to belong to Kenneth Blue. And then the blood on the outside of the glove was a mixture of Kenneth's and Jenny Webb's. A police theory is that Jenny, maybe trying to like fight him off, trying to get free from him, bit one of his fingers. And she probably bit off the tip of this latex glove and probably took like a chunk of his finger with it, which made him bleed all over the crime scene. So further tests were done on like other things like the car and different pieces of clothing to see if he had bled anywhere else. And when I say he bled all over the crime scene, I mean all over the crime scene. His blood was inside her car, outside her car, in his own patrol car, on the extension cord around her neck. It was on her clothing, it was on his clothing, although his clothing wasn't easy for police to get a hold of to be able to test. He seemed to want to cooperate with this whole investigation and with police and so he willingly handed over a bag that supposedly had his uniform in it that he was wearing that day but it wasn't his uniform. Well, it was his uniform, but it certainly wasn't one that had been worn. It had no creases in it, it smelled completely fresh. Like, if he'd been sitting down in his patrol car, it'd have creases in the back of the legs. It, it wasn't the uniform that he'd worn that day. And on a search of Kenneth Blue's truck at home, under one of the seats, police found his uniform stashed away. 
which is so suspicious. So they took it for testing and all over this uniform was his own blood. And on a further search of Jenny's car, they found multiple fingerprints all over the car, including one in blood. This print in the blood, however, wasn't fully formed. It was damaged a little bit, as if the finger had like a fresh wound on it. And so Kenneth Blue was fingerprinted to see if his fingerprints matched the one in the car. Now if you remember, when I said in his initial questioning he had all those injuries, he had a plaster on his index finger. And that same fingerprint was taken and it had damage to it. It wasn't fully formed, so it was wounded probably during the attack. And the fingerprint in the car perfectly matched this fingerprint that Kenneth Blue gave later on, even though they were slightly different because of the damage and the damage had started to heal on the newer one. The fact that the damage was in exactly the same place, it was obvious that it was Kenneth's. But the evidence just keeps coming. If you remember, that officer found a cigarette butt on the floor that was taken for testing and was found to have Kenneth Blue's DNA on it. That necklace charm found in the same area had Jenny Webb's DNA on it and that spot of blood was found to be Jenny's. Police theorised that the two of them met, Kenneth and Jenny met, near where these three items were found and he probably killed her there. They believe, like I said earlier, that he came up behind her, got her in a chokehold, she tried to fight back, she was scratching him, biting him, but ultimately he killed her. They then believe that he put her body in the back seat of her own car and then he drove that car 200 feet away to that dead end road, to that ditch where she was eventually found. They then believe that Kenneth Blue staged this whole scene for police to find. He tied the extension cord around her neck, tied it around the car. He got out this pre-written, pre-printed suicide note that he must have done a while before this and put it in her purse for someone to find. So as part of this whole investigation, Kenneth Blue's home was searched to see if there was any kind of evidence there maybe that he had a part in this. And there, police found identical extension cords to the one around Jenny's neck. They were actually all in the same drawer with these extension cords. It was like they kept them all in the same drawer. They kind of rolled them all up and then put a zip tie around each one. And in this drawer, there was kind of a space where one had been, but it wasn't anymore. And then there was a cut zip tie in its place. So it was as if someone had been in there, cut the zip tie, taken the extension cord, and used it. So it's very likely that the extension cord used to kill Jenny was his. They also searched his laptop history, his search history, and they found that he had searched in the days leading up to this, best way to commit suicide and vascular compression strangulation. But if all of that isn't enough, there is even more evidence. On the back of this supposed suicide note, there were 14 fingerprints, none of which were Jenny Webb's all of which were Kenneth Blue's. And none of the prints were damaged. They were all fully formed and they all seemed to match his new fingerprint that is now partially damaged because it's a little bit scarred, showing that he'd handled this suicide note before he'd even killed Jenny, showing premeditation, pre-planning. He had this ready, he had this whole thing planned. He thought he was gonna get away with it. So now there was nothing left to do other than to arrest Kenneth Blue. He was arrested on suspicion of four charges, including premeditated first degree murder, and assault of a pregnant individual intentionally resulting in miscarriage. And after this trial, Kenneth Blue was found guilty of all of his charges and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But even despite all of that evidence against him, I believe that is probably the most evidence there has been against an individual in a case that I've ever covered. Even with all of that evidence, Kenneth Blue's sister, Debbie Dennis, somehow still believes that he is innocent. Other than the whole obvious like, oh, I know my brother, I know he would never do anything like this, Debbie somehow also believes that there is insufficient evidence. She says there's no drag marks on her body if he really dragged her to and from her car all those times, where are all the drag marks? Jenny Webb had super long curly dark hair, why is none of that hair found on his uniform? 
Probably because it's super long and curly and dark and had he seen that hair on his uniform, he would have easily picked it off. Just because there happens to be no hair on his uniform doesn't mean that he didn't do it. There is so much evidence to say that he did. Debbie believes that Jenny was threatening Kenneth that she was going to end her life if he didn't put his name on the baby's birth certificate or if he didn't split up with his wife. A quote from Debbie is, I hate to say that she would have tied a cord around her neck just to scare him, but some women can be dramatic. She believes that Jenny was trying to scare Kenneth Blue into kind of staying with her and like bringing up this baby with her and whatever and she put this cord around her neck so that he would say that he would do that but she accidentally fell and killed herself. She then believes that Kenneth Blue's co-workers tried to frame him for this suicide and tried to make it look like a murder. I don't know for what reason she thinks that, but she says his co-workers have access to his blood and to his fingerprints, so they could have easily put his blood in that car and framed him for it. Although none of Debbie's claims have any evidence for them, they've all been found to be a load of crap, really. It just sounds to me as though she really wants her brother to be innocent, so she's now like lying to herself. She probably knows deep down that he is guilty. But yeah, that completes this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you want to see some more from me. Tomorrow is the last day of Valentine's crap, right? <laughs> The last day of what? Tomorrow is the last day of Valencrimes week and I'm kind of sad about it, but also I need a break. I'm so tired. A huge thank you to all of my channel members. All of their names are on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can just click the link in the description or if you're on a desktop, you can click the join button under the video. If you become a channel member, you'll get your name on this end card and you'll also have access to a members only community tab where I will ask for case suggestions, do polls to see what cases come next and you can just have a lot more say in what you see on the channel. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.